New Thinking Aloud is presented by the California Institute for Human Science, a fully accredited university offering distant learning graduate degrees that focus on mind, body, and spirit. The topics that we cover here. We are particularly excited to announce new degrees emphasizing parapsychology and the paranormal. Visit their website at cihs.edu. Thinking Aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we are going to explore Third Eye Spies. Now, this is the name of a new documentary produced by my old friend Russell Targ, who will be with us. Russell is the author of many books. Uh, he's been on nine previous interviews with me here on the New Thinking Aloud channel. Some of his titles, in, most recently for for example, include the reality of ESP, also limitless mind, and the heart of the mind, and mind reach, and many others as well. He also is the person who initiated the remote viewing program at SRI International, funded by the military intelligence organizations. And that's what this documentary is about. It is scheduled for public release in 500 theaters across the United States in February 2019. And what I'm going to do next is show you a 90-second preview of that documentary, and then we'll go to the Skype video where I've interviewed Russell Targ. If you had an ability to be able to remotely perceive stuff any place in the world, that could be an extraordinary intelligence source. We found that many individuals are able to accurately describe what's going on in distant locations. Are you saying that the work you've been doing is classified? It was a research facility. That was all that we were going to tell them. The Russians have been spending millions of dollars investigating so-called ESP. Psychic spies almost a psychic arms race here. Is there any real application to this? I think remote viewing has been demonstrated over the 20 years of work that's been sponsored by the government. Producing crucial and vital intelligence to the NSA, CIA, DEA, and the Secret Service. I began to feel frightened. The KGB did it, man. What's really going on here? State-sponsored assassination attempt. The CIA was lying. They wanted to kill the program. A storm brewing. This is real. I say no more secrets. Let this information out. Welcome, Russell. It's a pleasure to be with you again, and congratulations on uh, the release or the pending release of, of your documentary. I know you've been working on it for many years. Maybe uh, we could begin and, and you could explain to our viewers why uh, you put so much money and time and energy into this documentary. Why is it so important to you? I'm happy to be with you, Jeffrey, and I'm glad you got a chance to see my film, which is about to be released. The film is called Third Eye Spies, and it describes the work we did during the first decade of our psychic research and psychic spying activities at uh, SRI, Stanford Research Institute. So we had a 20-year program of which I participated in the first decade, Hal Putoff and I are both laser scientists, and we were involved in getting the program started 
because we had bona fides with the CIA and with NASA. So I could go into CIA in April of 1972 and say, I have an idea to teach people how to be psychic. And if they didn't know me from my earlier laser work, they would throw me out. Hmm. But because I had done work for them before, uh, I could get a hearing with Kit Green, who was a physician there, and he thought that that was interesting. And in due course, we were able to start a program at SRI. Now, I thought that was important because I spent my whole life doing magic. I was a magician from childhood. I was doing card tricks. And it was self-evident to me that we have psychic abilities. Mm -hmm. I remember as an eight-year-old, I would play cards with my mother, and I often knew what card was coming up next, and I just took that for granted. And I was a very successful card player. I didn't have a name for that. I didn't think I was psychic. I was just aware that I was a very fortunate card player. As a older, as a teenager, college student, I was playing duplicate bridge where you and your partner will play against uh, another couple and you have to play according to specific rules. And from time to time, the opponents would call the tournament director wanting to know if we had a secret code because we were too successful in doing things that should be 50-50. And they call it taking a finesse where you use a lower card to capture an upper card. And it just I would just have to make the decision, and I was very successful making the right decision. So I worked for 15 years as a physicist, even though I knew that one day I would be doing ESP research. But I had to get some kind of credential so that people would give me any money and pay attention to us. It's very hard, as we know, very hard for psychologists to get money to do ESP. A lot of people have done that, and had difficulty getting support. Uh, Hal and I were quite successful because NASA and the CIA just thought this is another program for these physicists and will fund them as though they're doing a physics program. And that was a million or two million dollars a year, which is outrageous for anybody trying to do ESP work. Of course, it's a small amount of money uh, for the government to spend, but uh, a lot of money in parapsychology. Uh, Russell, uh, you've, you've just, just told me now about some of your early psychic experiences. I know eventually you uh, contributed to the remote viewing program as a viewer yourself, but uh, prior to that time, had you ever actually tested your psychic abilities? I was never really tested in, in my lifetime. I took part in one remote viewing experiment at SRI in, in, our, in our 10 years. We had great psychics like Hella Hammond, Ingo Swan, Pat Price, Joe McMonagall, four people who are outstanding premier remote viewers who are able to quiet their minds and see what's going on in the distance or see what's going on in the future and describe and draw what's at that distant location. And they did that highly significantly. All of them were people who could do experiments at odds of one in a million. Uh, that, that was not me. The experiment you're talking about was a long distance series where Pat Price and I would sit in our little shielded room and Pat would describe where in South America Hal Putoff was traveling on a vacation. So Hal was gone for 10 days, and we realized this would be an outstanding time to do a controlled experiment. We, we weren't looking for uh, American hostages or Russian bomb tests. This was under our control. Hal knew where he would be, and of course, Pat Price and I in California had no idea where he was traveling. So each day, Pat would say, I see a harbor, or I see a church, or I see a volcano, or I see a marketplace. And on day five, Price didn't show up. 
So I'm <clears throat> so I'm sitting in my little room. This is Russ Targ and Pat Price describing Hal's location on day five, and Price didn't show up. So in the spirit that the show must go on anyway, I said, I will describe what I see. And what I saw was a airport, small airport on an island with sand and grass on the left, an airport building on the right, and ocean at the end of the runway. And I drew that. Hmm. So that's the only th thing that I had ever done for the program. And that turned out to be a surprisingly accurate picture so that somebody could fly by and take a picture of the airport and greatly resembles what I what I drew. In, in fact, I would say that that particular uh, drawing and transcript uh, ranks uh, right up there with the McMonagall and uh, Pat Price and Hella Hammond and Ingo Swan examples. Yes, it does. The interesting thing that comes from that, from that is that it shows that remote viewing is so easy that even a scientist can do it. <laughs> it doesn't re require metaphysical training. Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose one of the reasons that the government was willing to fund this program over and over again, year after year, is is because of uh, your credibility as a scientist. It's not as if you come across at all like uh, some sort of New Age uh, partisan or New Age guru. That's, that's true. I'm not coming across as a guru, but I think my strength at that period is that I came across with no hesitation or no doubt that psychic abilities were real. Mm -hmm. That is, oftentimes when we go to ESP conferences, even people who have spent a lifetime doing research are still, they say things like, gee, if ESP were real, then we would see such and such. And a distinguished person said that to me on the 100th anniversary of the Society for Psychic Research, American professor got up and spoke and said, I'm happy to be here celebrating the 100th year of the SPR. If this is ever shown to be true, it'll be very important for all of us. And I was ready to punch him in the nose. Because <laughs> many of us had, at this point, spent our lifetime doing this kind of work. Yeah. But I think it's part of your unique personality that you you have a way of saying this is real, and, and, and people get it because you are such a focused, solid human being that when you say it's real, it sticks. I think probably... That's because I have no doubt in my mind. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can t I'm not pushing my own psychic prowess, but what, one of the things that came to me uh, early, early in my laser career, I was I would drive back and forth with my boss, who was head of the research laboratory at Sylvania, and he was a very thoughtful man. He was a uh, a musician, and he taught. Midrash, which is uh, ta Talmud at the Theological Seminary. So it was not a, he was not interested in the psychic stuff, but he was a man of broad interest. And as we're driving home, I said, you know, Morris, I have this strange image that doesn't look like it's mine. Um, I see an oval table with candlesticks, and there's a book, and it looks like a f black pa pages with white letters, and somebody is drawing green circles and red checks. And that doesn't look like anything that I've ever seen. Now, I was not completely naive. that I'm, I'm aware of what psychic images look like. And I have done a lot of experience. And the key to recognizing a psychic image is to ha have it clear and bizarre and outside your normal experience. That is, if we were passing Flushing Meadows, and if I saw, if I visualized a baseball diamond, that would not be very significant. But here I had a collection of images that truly made no sense and were outside of my experience. So he said, well, uh, oh, and I saw that they were Hebrew letters, and I don't read Hebrew. He said, well, my old friend Schreiber is often looking at manuscripts. He's a rabbi, and he's got a table like that. So the next day, I went to Morris's house, and he unrolled this manuscript, 
which was in fact a photostat, which doesn't exist anymore, of a Hebrew document that Schreiber was annotating. So he had the white Hebrew letters. If he liked the thing the way it was written, he would give it a green circle. If he thought it was wrong, he'd give it a red X. So basically, I completely described this bizarre thing outside of my description. Hmm. And in my life, from time to time, that sort of uh, unasked for surprising image is a key for me that this is brought to me by ESP. Mm -hmm. It's very hard. The problem with doing ESP experiments is this, is the thing that the person imagines it is not does not have a little tag on it saying this image is brought to you by ESP. That would be very nice. Yeah, but we don't have that. But I've now got a dozen years experience as an interviewer talking to people, helping them pull out of their unconscious or out of their subconscious the psychic image as compared with the, the noise. So it's really. In engineering term, you say that ESP is a signal-to-noise problem, and I can't help them with their ESP, but I can help them because of my experience and discernment um, help them tell what's psychic and what's not. And you and I had an experience just like that. Well, that was your basic function, I guess, in, in the laboratory, or one of your major functions is, is being what is sometimes called a monitor uh, a, a, of a remote viewing experiment. Yeah, I, w I was the interviewer, which I've come to think of in this film. The interviewer is really a, <clears throat> excuse me, interviewer is really a very appropriate name in that I'm the, I'm not a viewer, but I'm between the, subject and the target. So I'm sort of an interviewer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's an interesting way to, to put it. But in effect, you've got a, a research subject, a percipient who is put into a sealed room. And at the radio physics laboratory at SRI, you had a room that was so sealed that radio signals could not penetrate it. That's right. We're all locked in with cipher locks. And I can say anything, as the experiment you and I did, I can say anything to you as an interviewer because I have no idea what the target pool is. I have no idea where you might possibly be, and certainly not where the people are hiding on that day. And and so your role is, is to help the percipient or the viewer uh, elicit the correct information about the target. That's right. Even though... It's a, it's a skill you develop. I'm not saying I could do that because I'm psychic. Yeah. In, the, in, in the trial we did, you were getting your PhD at Berkeley, and you wanted to see what are they doing at SRI. Yeah. And I said, well, I'll just show you how to do it. And I think Elizabeth Rauscher, the physicist we work with, went to hide somewhere, and her traveling instructions came from the safe, and I didn't know what was there. And you said, I closed my eyes, and it looks to me like Macy's. And I rudely said, uh, Jeffrey, don't tell me about Macy's. Now, could have been Macy's, yeah. but having an analytical description like Macy's doesn't sound like psychic abilities. Psychic, remote viewing is not an analytical task. It's a non-analytical task of fragments and pictures and shapes and forms. So we started over, and you then gave a very good description of where she was, which was a pedestrian overpass where there were lots of wires and crossbars that looked like clothes hanging on clothes hangers, which is what you saw. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a perfect example of, of what has come to be known as analytical overlay. And, and you were masterful in helping me to uh, uh, just give you the raw description of the shapes and forms that I was seeing with without that analysis. That's right. The magic word they said is, what are you experiencing that makes you think of Macy's? Yeah. And you then describe the, the coat hangers and the wires and so forth. And you made a splendid description of this pedestrian overpass. 
Mm -hmm. Now, the thing that we're able to do in the film that's new is we got to see, I can tell you about all, all sorts of interesting things. Down, we found downed airplanes, Soviet weapon factories, hit, hostages carried away in Africa. And, and that's very interesting. And if you believe me, um, as many people will, that sounds like an amazing way to spend a decade. In the film, we were able to get the cooperation on camera of our two senior CIA uh, scientists. We had Kit Green, who's a physician, head of the life science branch at the CIA, and Ken Kress, who's a PhD physicist, who was an operational undercover person who was eventually given charge to work with Hal and me. Mm -hmm. There's uh, Sid Gottlieb, who was sort of the uh, force behind this. Uh, Gottlieb Rhett was running the MK Ultra program, and in his mind, we were sort of a subset of MK Ultra. And, and in fact, he wanted me to use LSD to enhance people's psychic ability. Yeah, MK no. Ultra, as I recall, goes back what to the 1950s and did involve the administration of LSD to uh, I think unsuspecting persons. That's right, to scrub out their memories. And, and I told Gottlieb, uh, I'm familiar with LSD, but remote viewing is a intellectual activity where you need your analytical functions to help you separate the signal from the noise. And when somebody has taken LSD, they're both not interested in doing your silly task, and their analytical functions are, of course, greatly impaired. Mm -hmm. And he understood that. Yeah. But um, our good fortune is that we came along just when uh, all these senior people were retiring. So Ken Kress and Kit Green who are both uh, formidable, highly respected scientists and SRI and CIA uh, agents come on camera and look into the lens and say, yes, I was there. These things really happened just the way Tarek says. And that's priceless. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, they, they may or may not believe me, but these two uh, scientists giving heartfelt descriptions of what they saw and how they participated in the experiments, what they believed and what they didn't believe, is really uh, what carries the film. Mm -hmm. Well, as I understand it, Russell, the program uh, was initiated by you and Hal Putoff at SRI International, a major uh, industrial uh, military think tank in Menlo Park, California, but at, at some point a decision was made to open up a separate unit within the Army at uh, Fort Meade, Maryland. Uh, can you describe how that came about? That's right. Through the whole program, one of the things that's really not known and not in the files is, in a certain sense, they didn't trust me. And, the, and we have Ken Kress on film saying you were really doing great work in the program, and we know you from your laser work, but basically we didn't trust you because you were enthusiastic. You, you were too enthusiastic over this stuff. So we, 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 we were doubted your um, credulity, or were concerned about your credulity. Mm -hmm. And no one ever came to me in my laser lab and said, we can't give you money because you, le you believe in lasers. Uh, that would be ridiculous. So it, it really was not until we made the film when Chris would really look right at me and said, you guys really did great work. Uh, you described the weapons factory. You found the airplane. You found the hostages. But basically, we felt that we had to take this away from you because Pat Price was essentially omniscient. He could quiet his mind and describe anything and read hidden objects. And conceivably, he could ride, conceivably, he could psychically see the launch codes to release a nuclear missile. So they, they were somewhat frightened of Pat Price because he could, every task they gave him, he could do that. He could describe the weapon shop in Russia, 
what was underground in Russia, what was in the safe at the National Security Agency in Virginia. He was just almost 100% and very, very accurate, and he could read. And the CIA had this prime function keeping things secret, and with Price, there were no secrets. So that really troubled them. So at the end of one series where he was describing uh, a giant crane and underground tanks in central Russia, they just took Price away from uh, SRI and set him up as a functionary, as an operative for the CIA in Virginia. Mm -hmm. But then the Fort Meade program uh, developed uh, after that, I presume. That's right. The Fort Meade program started after they took they took Price away from us because, uh, in a certain sense, he was too hot to handle. The Price was too dangerous to be left to the researchers in California. And what they wanted me to do is train up some Army intelligence officers so they could have them under complete control, as they did with Price. Mm -hmm. So Hal and I were introduced into a room of 30 Army officers, men and women, mainly men. Choose six that you can train to be remote viewers. And we, we did that, and I got to choose Joe McMonigal as uh, one, one of those. And he became uh, an excellent world-class remote viewer, and, and he still does that work. That's right. He, as far as I know, Joe is the most reliable, uh, competent remote viewer in the world today. Mm -hmm. And he was the first one that I had the task of training from this Army group. Of course, I had showed lots and lots of people how to do remote viewing before Joe. Joe came and perhaps... 1978, so I was prepared to deal with him. So he was my first customer in the Army program. And so would you say that you trained uh, Joe and the other uh, initial recruits? Training is an overstatement. Uh, psychic remote viewing is a natural ability. So uh, I ba basically give him permission to, to use an ability he already has. I used to do workshops at Esalen where I would have people, I have a couple of dozen people for a weekend where I would have them do various different kinds of tasks, find the hidden person, describe the object in the box, um, things like that, mm -hmm. to learn, learn the process of dealing, of separating the signal from the noise. Mm -hmm. uh, with Joe, he was so ready. He said, no, no, I've never done anything like this. And I said, well, Hal has gone somewhere with your colonel. They've gone to hide. Can you describe where he is? And he made a number of little drawings. And I said, well, it's coming to the end of the time. Of those drawings, which, ones do you, which one do you like best? And he said, well, I like this one here, which is a long, low building in front of a higher building that has pillars in front of it, like piano keys, and then there's a fountain. And it was really a splendid architectural drawing of the Stanford Art Museum. Mm -hmm. And as I recall later on, he produced a very complex architectural-looking drawing of the Lawrence uh, Livermore Laboratory. Yeah, that yes, was... he did. So, so Joe, Joe was a accomplished... Uh, architectural artist. He he could draw whatever he could see, whether it was in front of him or psychically. Mm -hmm. So I had Joe and five other people who claimed to have never done anything like this, certainly no remote viewing. And of those six people, four of them were really outstanding. So the whole group together uh, performed at odds of better than a million to one that I would do six trials with each of the six people. So I did 36 people, and you would expect, I misspoke, I did 36 trials with the six people. Mm -hmm. You would expect 
six of those to be in first place match by still by luck alone be- because like, there were six targets in the pool i assume that's right mm-hmm. and we got 19 first place matches which was startlingly accurate and we pre- when we presented data like this to the parapsychological conference people simply thought we were lying because no one had ever seen uh, ESP data at odds of a million to one with only 30 trials. You typically have to do hundreds of thousands of trials to get something at odds of a million to one. And our effect size, which is the statistical significance divided by the uh, number of trials, our effect size was so much greater. A fixed size is basically the strength of what you're looking at. Was so much greater than what anybody had seen before. They just couldn't believe that a couple of physicists had invented a way to do ESP, and it was working a hundred times better than anyone had seen in the history of parapsychology. Well, what you were doing used to be known as free response clairvoyance and uh, people doing free response clairvoyance tests go back uh, many, many decades. Why is it that uh, do you believe your results were so much more successful? I understand what you're asking me. It's an interesting question. I think it was successful because in the Free response. I'm making this up now. Mm-hmm. This is what I think. I think we were the first people to ever use a interviewer. <clears throat> I think that that was not part of normal free response. In free response, uh, in the Rhine Lab, I am guessing they would say, "There's a picture in the envelope. Could be anything. Tell me about it." Mm-hmm. The person would have to do that, and if they had never done it before, they'd have no. They would guess. As you did. Yeah. And the image came in and said, it looks to me like the King of Spades. Uh-huh. Or it looks to me like Macy's. Yeah. Now, an interviewer who, it's as though I was asking you to tell me something in French, and you just said something different, and I said, you know, that doesn't actually sound like French. Why don't we, why don't we try it again? Mm. So my, my strength as an interviewer if somebody would say something, I'd say, you know, that simply doesn't sound like remote viewing. Mm-hmm. But let's tell me what you're feeling. How, mm-hmm. what, what else comes to view? Mm-hmm. And I think that that was very helpful in a strict signal to noise way. Now, Ingo brought us the idea of analytical overlay and mental noise uh, in the recent period, that is in the 1940s. René Wauquelier, the French engineer, wrote a book called Mind to Mind, where he talks about uh, mental noise and the problems with guessing. Mm. He describes that at some length. Uh, the first person who talked about that at any length was the Buddhist Dharma master Padmasambhava in the 8th century. He wrote a very nice book called Self-Liberation through seeing with naked awareness. He's the one who brought Buddhism to Tibet, as I recall. Exactly. He's a historical person. Yeah. And uh, he's the one who said, your nature is timeless awareness. You're not really made of steak and potatoes, but your nature is timeless awareness. And if you quiet your mind, you can expand your awareness into timeless realms. For example... He said, what he said, on on a line we were talking about before, if you want to expand your mind, you have to give up your desire to grasp and to name what you're seeing. So in the 8th century, instructors were telling you already, don't try and name the object. Hmm. Because that's analytical errors. And so that's been understood for 1,200 years. And you seem to have a natural feeling for it. That's right. And and Ingo set down uh, that you shouldn't do do that. Mm -hmm. 
If I may, let me um, regress. We were talking a little earlier about Pat Price and how uh, the CIA determined uh, to bring him under their own control. And your documentary makes a, a big issue of the fact that shortly after he left SRI to work directly with the CIA, uh, he died. And his yep. death uh, remains, in your mind, at least something of a mystery. Yes. Uh, Price died at what I now think of as a young man. He died. He was 30 years younger than what I am right now. So I don't feel that. I, and I'm fine. Mm -hmm. so I, I didn't expect Pat Price to die in his middle 50s. But uh, one of the things that the CIA discovered, which we point out in the film, is they discovered that uh, Pat Price, who is an enthusiastic Scientologist, would meet with his auditor each day after taking part in these top secret activities he was doing with Ken Kress. So Ken was running Pat Price like an agent. Mm -hmm. And he would say, what's going on here? What's going on in the Libyan embassy? Which we talk about in the film, where he described accurately where the code room in the Libyan embassy was, and he was in the code room because he had other information about it. So Price was a formidable psychic spy, beyond what anyone had ever seen before. And each day, after taking part in these top-secret activities, he would tell his Scientology monitor um, what he and Ken had been doing at the CIA. Mm. Now, that's absolutely true, what I've told you. I don't know that the CIA learned that before the break-in of the Scientology Celebrity Center. I didn't learn this until two years later, where the Celebrity Center was broken into by the, by the IRS, mm. Internal Revenue Service, because Scientology was not paying taxes and, and other things. And the, it was the FBI and the IRS who discovered this whole file of Pat Price and Ken Kress doing psychic spying. And then they called Kress, and that's all in the film. Kress describes his horror discover <clears throat> at discovering that um, not only was his cover blown, but that uh, Price was revealing all of this information. Now, that's true. I don't know that the CIA discovered that early on. Mm -hmm. Now, Price was a pretty smart guy and very psychic, but he wasn't a trained spy. He was just living in his farmhouse in Virginia, and every day he would meet with his Scientology contract monitor, and we know that that occurred because we've got the data. Yeah. He, so, he was a police commissioner, as I recall. That's right, a police commissioner in the city of Burbank. So what I'm conjecturing in the film, and no proof of this, is that since Price was no spy, he wasn't trained in spycraft, and he was working for the CIA, he probably got caught in telephonic conversation with the CIA, with the Scientologists, or overheard or intercepted mail. Can you imagine? I mean, he's only a few miles from CIA headquarters working with them on this top secret stuff. I'm, it seems obvious to me that he was surveilled in some way. It wouldn't make, it wouldn't make, put it the other, it wouldn't make sense if they let this old, psychic guy work day after day with no surveillance. That wouldn't make sense. Hmm. And I think that they discovered, uh, as I put in the film, the Superman was a double agent. He was working for the CIA and he was working for the Scientologists, and that they insuperable problem. Hmm. What, what, are the, what do you do when you discover that Superman is working for the other side as well? 
Well, you seem to imply in in the film that this might have been a Russian operation. As I recall, there was some hint about uh, uh, Russian intelligence saying that they had murdered a psychic. We we had uh, so, someone told that story to Hal. Yes, mm-hmm. or he could have. Had, so as I, in the in the film, I have a conversation with Uri Geller in a shielded room in his house in England. Where, because Geller is a very psychic guy and has worked for Mossad for years. Mm-hmm. So I told him that, uh, of course, Pat could have had a heart attack because he had a heart condition. The CIA could have killed him or the Russians could have killed him. Those are the three possibilities that come to mind. It might, other, might, might be some fourth undreamed of possibility, mm-hmm. <clears throat> but I would say, um, from my guess, it's most likely that it was the CIA or the Russians, and I have no first-hand excellent information to allow me to make the decision. But somehow, the 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 truth is that five months after leaving us, the most psychic man in the world mysteriously died, mm-hmm. and he knew he was going to die because he said goodbye to a lot of people. He bought a million dollar life insurance, term insurance for his wife at the airport as he was leaving. And he changed his plans to make sure he visited his son in Salt Lake City before he came to visit us at SRI. And he then died in Las Vegas. So Price was aware that his life was in danger. Mm-hmm. Well, and this. Then- this sure. brings up a, a much larger issue. Uh, I've known you for many decades, Russell. I think of you as a very sensitive, humanistic person, uh, obviously a, a, a deep student of Buddhism and, and other esoteric traditions. How comfortable were you working for the CIA and for military intelligence all of these years? Do you think that's really a, a, an appropriate uh, home for parapsychology research? No, it's not an appropriate home for parapsychology research, but it was a good opportunity at that time. I had things that I wanted to do, so I sought out. This is 1972. Mm-hmm. I had already built a uh, PK electron beam device that you don't know anything about, where a person could uh, may, I built an electron beam device where a person with his mind could move the electron beam and uh, move it on a galvanometer. Mm-hmm. I built my four-choice ESP teaching machine, which is still available f- from the Apple Store at no charge, an ESP trainer. So I had really a lifetime of doing experiments in this field. Mm-hmm. And, and working I, with hardware. That's right. And I was ready uh, to bet my career that I could show people how to do this. That I was 15 years into laser. I was a senior scientist doing laser stuff. And I told my wife, where we had three little children in a house in Palo Alto, I'm going to do something different now than this laser stuff. I'm going to start an ESP program because I was completely confident that it was going to work from my life experience. Mm -hmm. So if you say, what what made you think it was going to work? The answer is, I knew it was going to work. I mean, there's no, in a certain sense, why, why would it not work? Well, it sounds so, like you knew it was going to work much in the same way that Pat Price knew he was going to die. That's right. Now, um, Buddhism is really not a religion. Buddhism offers you a group of tenets and practices that allow you to control your mind. That they, for example, one of the things, that it gives you contact with the off switch. When you're trying to meditate, what, what do you do when the chatter won't go away? Or what do you do when you think you're suffering? Or are overcome with unhappiness? Buddhism gives you a group of things to do to modulate the way you experience your life and experience the world. And they have for millennia been aware 
that you can quiet your mind and see into the distance, see into the future, heal the sick, communicate with deceased people. And that's written about at great length. In my recent book, The Reality of ESP, I quote from this Buddhist tome, uh, the Flower Ornament Scripture, which is a big Buddhist book written at the time of Christ, which, among other things, spells out all the different things available to the prepared quiet mind. So the idea of practicing high-level functioning of psychic ability is identified and spelled out within Buddhism. And by the way, you're expected to have that ability. You're not expected to take it to Las Vegas or to spy for the CIA, but you're expected to be able to include the elements of a broader awareness, a timeless awareness, expected to bring that into your life. So I felt that... uh, in a certain sense, ESP is what it is. It's available uh, if the CIA... I didn't do any unethical. We didn't kill any people or or spy on any people who didn't want to be spied on. So I had my ethics intact. We just took money from some nefarious people to do some uh, research that wouldn't have gotten done otherwise. Mm-hmm. Now, that can just be... Uh, an apology, or I could be fooling myself. Uh, everything we've done now, or the great preponderance of it, is now revealed, and there's no, never been any stinking fish pulled out. How could you guys have done such a terrible thing? I mean, there, there is no such terrible thing that we ever, ever did. We, we found General Dozier, who was kidnapped by the Red Brigade, and we reported on uh, Richard Queen, who was captured by the Iranian hostages, and described his health, where he was, and the fact that he would be released because he was so sick. So we did a lot of amazing things. The, the, the Richard Queen, a head of uh, naval intelligence, came to us and said, we have a picture of a person in this envelope can you tell me what his situation is? That was a sealed envelope. So I sat down with the psychic in our little shielded phone booth, and he said, it's dark where the guy is. He's very sick. He's having trouble moving um, and so forth. But I see him leaving the place and getting on an airplane very soon. So that all took 15 minutes mm-hmm. to locate the guy, describe his situation, and describe what was going to happen in the future. So I think that working for the CIA is certainly problematic. I realize they're a nefarious organization, killed a lot of people with MK Ultra, but but we didn't do that. Mm-hmm. So the the as they say in the in the stock market, the money is fungible. As people gave us money to do what we thought was interesting. We published our findings in Nature and in the proceedings of the radio engineers and the uh, American Institute of Physics. So we published our work in first-rate, prestigious American worldwide organizations. And the part that was secret uh, has now been revealed. Partly, as I got interested in this film, I went back to the CIA under Freedom of Information and got a vast quantity of material released. So there's now 70,000 documents since I was after, since I asked for the clearance. And there's ne- So I would say that, in answer to your question, uh, of all the 70,000 documents, there was never some smoking gun for a terrible thing we did. Mm-hmm. Well, as I recall, you left that program in the early 1980s and went on to do some other very interesting work after that. But the uh, military intelligence involvement continued for more than a decade after you left. And then it was eventually disbanded. As far as we know today, there's no public information available, to my knowledge, of of any 
government-sponsored parapsychological uh, activity, certainly not at the applied level. Uh, how do you think uh, remote viewing will evolve into the future? Well, in the film, we talked to Kit Green, and he says he assumes that the program is still going on. Mm. Of the people who came to look at our program from the CIA, two of them turned out to be excellent remote viewers. And we know from uh, interviewing, the, this film is really remarkable. We had many, many hours with both Ken Kress and Kit Green. So we get a chance to spend uh, several days interviewing Ken Kress, for example. And we learned that the people that I trained up, a man and a woman, who had done very good remote viewing with me, went back to the CIA and was then doing remote viewing with Pat Price. So they had a little remote viewing book club come off to the side doing this stuff. And uh, since remote viewing works so well and so meets the requirements of the CIA, it would be uh, absurd in a certain sense for them not to be doing it. Mm -hmm. And in the film, uh, Ken Kress said that some high-level people have told them that, that it's still going on in the basement of the CIA. And that would make sense. It, it would make sense, and I suppose it, it might be a good thing. But overall, for viewers of your uh, new documentary and for viewers of this New Thinking Aloud series who might wish to pursue their own remote viewing abilities, uh, working with the CIA is is probably not in the cards. No, that would not be ideal. Uh, in, in my book, uh, The Reality of ESP, I have a chapter telling you on how to work with a friend. I don't tell you how to find a friend, but <laughs> assuming, assuming you have a friend, you could work with that person to do remote viewing trials, as we did at SRI, learning how to separate the signal from the noise. In our film, The Third Eye Spies, uh, we show people doing remote viewing on camera uh, with very great success. In fact, the, the third eye is part of Hindu tradition. It would be 2,500 years ago, uh, Patanjali, in the Sutras of Patanjali, he describes um, in a chapter called Powers, where he talks about looking into the distance, looking into the future, healing the sick, and diagnosing illnesses as part of your meditation. He says, now it's very dangerous. Don't get hung up on psychic abilities. Psychic abilities could be a stumbling block toward your own transcendence and spiritual development, but it's out there, so I'll give you a chapter on what psychic abilities are like. So that's 2,500 years ago. Uh, this was very well understood. Mm -hmm. And the the third eye itself, I believe, refers to the Ajna Chakra located right about here, uh, which is thought to be a, an organ of psychic sensitivity. It's thought to be the pineal gland. We don't know that that's true. That is the that is no evidence at all that it's true. But that the that's what the Hindus believed. Uh, and their meditation, the Sanyama meditation, was to quiet your mind. And in Patanjali's writing, it's as though you're developing the psychic muscle. Mm -hmm. It's as though you're developing your pineal gland, and it allows you to become more psychic. Now, I have no reason to believe that that's true at all except he, he was right about a lot of other things. Yeah, and he, there's fascinating lore concerning the pineal gland. Certainly, if you do, if you meditate, our, our best meditators have been psychics in general, mm -hmm. and meditators who, and psychics who weren't doing meditation initially became meditators because they th thought that it was helpful. Yeah, I think you meant to say your, your best remote viewers have been meditators. Yes, yeah. 
So uh, surely for anybody who uh, who is on a spiritual path, meditation is a very good thing to uh, learn. And uh, along the way, almost anybody on a spiritual path is is going to open up in some way or another to various uh, what parapsychologists call psi abilities. That's right. When I was first a graduate student at Columbia, I got involved with the Theosophical Society in New York. So I was 20 years old, and I learned about this organization that was interested in psychic stuff, and they had a beautiful home in Midtown Manhattan, and they frequently had lectures on fairies, psychic abilities, uh, the ancient wisdoms. So you had to separate the, the... the good from the bad, the uh, useful to the non-useful, but they their general tenor was uh, sort of a, a new spin. Helena Blavatsky had a new spin on um, the the Vedic tradition. Mm-hmm. Well, I, that's fascinating, and of course, the the Theosophical Society is a very important organization and terms of the evolution of the whole consciousness movement and what has come to be known as New Age culture. But it it strikes me that the fundamental message of your documentary is uh, that remote viewing is an ability uh, available to virtually everybody. That's right. It's available to anybody. Some people are better than others. Uh, Our nature is timeless awareness. That is... Um, you can expand your awareness into timeless realms, and that's an ability we have, and that's taught throughout uh, Dzogchen Buddhism. Mm-hmm. That's a, a, all, all the Dzogchen teachers agree that you can learn learn to do that as part as part of your nature. And the reason that I sort of dwell back and forth between what was going on 2,500 years ago. Is they want to a- emphasize that psychic abilities are not new age. Mm-hmm. This isn't weird stuff that was just developed uh, in the 1980s. Mm-hmm. Well, Russell Target, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I wish uh, your documentary a very successful run, and I look forward to, uh, now that we have established this uh, effective Skype connection, to uh, being able to have more conversations with you in the future. That's right. Skype works even better than remote viewing. <laughs> I just look out, and there you are. Here I am. Well, thank you so much for being with me today, Russell. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's been a great pleasure to talk with you. Likewise. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Three in the new Thinking Aloud dialogue series is UFOs and UAP, Are We Really Alone? Now available on Amazon. You can now download a free PDF copy of Issue 7 of the new Thinking Aloud magazine or order a beautiful printed copy.